we didn't have a whole lot of hope. And it was like finding a needle in a haystack. We had to find human remains. No justice. I have yet to receive any justice. I couldn't say his name. I couldn't talk about him without just crying. There is zero remorse in all of this. We know that the blood was probably half an inch deep in there. The chill just went down my back. I think behind that mask was evil. shocked all of us at people. It's a tragedy that never had to happen, carried out in such a depraved manner that it makes you question the good in the world. And it makes you wonder about the truly random nature of chance meetings. Father was uh, an amazing dad. He's very gregarious, very social, easy to make friends. He was always the life of the party. He wasn't the kind of person that would you know, kind of sit in the corner and watch people interact. He was always the one interacting and making people laugh. He was always willing to help someone out. I don't think I ever met someone who disliked my dad. Everyone was very, very fond of him, and they liked being around him. Zachary's dad was raised in South Boston in a family immersed in the culture of martial arts and fitness. <laughs> My dad and my uncle Mark shared that passion of karate with my grandpa. My dad would, would go do karate at least two to three times a week. That was a big part of my dad's life growing up. When my grandpa Al created his karate dojo, he made a symbol with a red dragon with a yin yang sign on it. And my grandpa Al got that tattooed on his body. And it kind of became a family tradition to where my dad got it on his arm and my uncle Mark got it on his arm as well. My dad would wear a ring that commemorated the dragon tattoo as well. Josh and his brother Mark are very close and they share a fervent. Basketball, he was probably the biggest Boston fan I've ever known. He would make it a point to go to as many Celtics games and Red Sox games as he could. And that's a big reason why I am a huge Boston sports fan. Although Zachary has a very close relationship with his dad, he spends most of his time living with his mother. My parents split up and got divorced when I was about two years old. I would spend at least six to eight weeks a year in Boston with him. And so that became kind of a big part of my upbringing. My dad, he wasn't one to be locked down. He, he liked to date. In 1999, at a Christmas party. Every time I saw them around each other, they, they fit perfectly. She was just one of the nicest people I've ever met. I never saw her upset, angry, raise her voice. Uh, she was very calm and just a happy, loving person. She made my dad very happy, and so that I, I liked her because of that. In 2001, Josh and Jeannie have been together for two years. Jeannie's a busy insurance executive, and Josh has become a successful mortgage broker. And both of them are self-described workaholics. Josh's work ethic pays off when he's offered a job in Fairfax, Virginia. It's a job that's too good to pass up. So he and Jeannie leave Boston and make a big move to the D.C. area. I was very excited to go visit him. I'm a big history nerd, so I was hoping that we can go visit and then go check out the sites in DC as well. In May 2002, for Memorial Day weekend, the hardworking couple decide to take a last minute getaway to Ocean City, Maryland, and they celebrate the official start to summer. My name is Brett Case. Retired detective, a lovely place to visit in the summertime. 
I'm Scott Bernal. I was the lead detective with Ocean City Police Department. Ocean City is a unique area. It's um, a resort area. Families from every state I can think of on the East Coast and uh, come to visit, and usually everyone has a good time. Memorial Day weekend is especially wild in Ocean City. Thousands of visitors crowd the beaches, local bars, and nightclubs. There's a population of 20, 25,000 um, year-round residents, and in the summertime, that fluctuates from anywhere from 300 to 500,000 people in Ocean City. It's demanding. May 28th, 2002. The holiday weekend is over, and everyone's returning back to work. That is, everyone except Josh and Jeannie. Mark was very concerned for his brother. It was Saturday night that he last heard from him. After the Celtics won on Saturday night, brothers Mark and Josh had tried to congratulate one another over the phone. But the bar Josh was in was too noisy to talk, so they made plans to talk the next day. Mark had called his brother the next day, and no answer. Jeannie had an appointment that she up. She never called. Even while she was on vacation, she called these people. So when they stopped hearing from her, it was so out of character that they reported her missing right away. Jeannie's colleagues contact their local law enforcement in Fairfax to then reach out to Ocean City Police. The phone rang, and it was Detective Mike Boone from Fairfax, Virginia Police Department. And he asked me if we've heard of two missing people from Fairfax, and I had not. Detective Boone informed me that they were staying at the Atlantis condominium and gave me the, the unit number. Driving has a distinct feature, a license plate that says Genie. So I called my supervisor, and he ordered me to go home. He didn't want to pay the overtime. For the first time in my career, I disobeyed an order and I went with my gut. Detectives head over to the Atlantis condominiums to see if there are any signs of Jeannie or Josh. As I pulled in, the parking lot was basically empty except for Jeannie's car. But as I inspected the car, I can tell that it hadn't been moved for a while. There was sand and leaves and debris at the tires. Frozen in time. When I walked into that unit, it was as if someone had just picked up and left. Wine glasses were left out with half drank wine in them. Their belongings are unpacked. Everything was there. Computers, cameras, clothing. Her wallet was there, his wallet, cash, credit cards. Everything except for their driver's licenses. That's the only thing we couldn't find. Detectives find a receipt from the Green Turtle a popular Ocean City bar that is timestamped for Saturday night. They also find another receipt crumbled up in the garbage pail. We did an inventory of what was on that grocery list. They had bought things you would have, uh, you know, pack a lunch to take onto the beach, that kind of, those kind of items were there. Everything that they had purchased was in that unit. It's been three days since anyone last heard from them. So seeing what I saw was alarming. Well, what would be keeping these people from normally communicating with family and friends? Why aren't they here? It just seemed like, you know, they, they had somehow just disappeared. Realizing that Josh Ford and Jeannie Crutchley are missing, law enforcement springs into action. It's possible that a lot of leads are being lost as beach vacationers start to head home. You've got to move fast. We put a flyer out as quickly as possible to local businesses. We send the flyers to all the patrol division officers at all their roll calls. We checked all the hospitals and jails, and there weren't any of those places. For the Ford family, it's now starting to sink in that something bad may have happened to Josh. And Josh's ex-wife agonizes over how to tell her son. When I came back home after school, my mom and stepdad and my dad had disappeared. 
I was eight years old at the time when I heard that news. Um, and I don't think my brain could understand. I, I think I was thinking disappeared, like he went on vacation, like you guys just can't find him. What, what do you mean? Like, when, just, when can I see my dad again? Detectives turned to the receipt from the Green Turtle found in Josh and Jeannie's Atlantis condo unit. With the overwhelming crowds that holiday weekend, it's doubtful any of the staff will remember them, but Detective Bernal figured... We put a flyer up on the door. We did ask everybody, even the patrons, and one of the waitresses actually remembered Josh and Jeannie because they were so nice, so kind. The waitress remembers the couple eating there but she doesn't recall seeing them after they paid their bill. But we noticed right outside or close to the Green Turtle restaurant was a bus stop. It's referred to in the summertime as the drunk bus. People are using alcohol and drinking and having fun and take the buses so they don't need to use their cars. Detectives review the transit system logs for remarkably, he remembers Josh and Chini because of their generosity. The bus driver recalled Josh and Jeannie offered to pay for another couple's bus fee because they didn't have change for a 20. The bus driver tells police that the couple who Josh and Jeannie helped were Caucasian and in their 20s. They all got off the bus together when it stopped at Secrets. Secrets is a phenomenon. It might be one of the top 10 popular bars on the East Coast. And on the holiday weekends, it is packed. There's probably a you know, thousand people waiting in line to get into them. Detectives question secret staffers, and some of them remember seeing the... About an hour. They were all talking, and the four of them went inside. Bar staff remember the two couples partying together, but no one remembers seeing them leave the bar or any details. For police, that's where the trail ends. There are no clues as to what happened to Josh and Jeannie after they were seen at Secrets. We really were at a stalemate. We had to beat the bushes to find out everything and anything we could, and uh, it just wasn't coming up. Three days after Josh and Jeannie disappeared, in the midnight hour... Patrol officers responded and found the car backed up to the Hooters. The door to the Hooters merchandise store was wide open, and half the items from within the store were sitting either in the vehicle or on the curb. Noticing that this is an obvious robbery in progress, patrol officers approach and find a male and a female with Hooters merchandise in hand. My name is Joel Todd. I was the state's attorney for Worcester County, Maryland. The suspect couple then asked if they could just put the stuff back and then everybody could forget about this. Of course, our officers didn't fall for that and uh, placed them both in asks. They find flex cuffs, which are used to bind someone's hands. In the middle of the search, the female suspect begins to have a panic attack. She asks, can I get my purse? I need some medication that's in there. So the officers search for it in her purse. And in her purse, they found that she was carrying a 357 Magnum revolver, along with a live round and four casings Next to it was these two driver's licenses that belonged to Josh and Jeannie. And to the people that were missing that they had heard about in roll call, the hair on the back of their neck stood up. About 2 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call uh, from a supervisor. He says, Scott, uh, we got a burglary at Hooters. And in the suspect's purse, we located the driver's license of your two missing people. And the chill just went down my back. Detective Bernal immediately proceeds to the scene of the robbery. Police have identified the suspects in custody as married couple Erica Sifrit and Benjamin B.J. Sifrit. When I rolled up, she signed them and agreed to speak with me. She told me she had no idea why those licenses for Jeannie and Josh were in her purse. 
She also told me she didn't know about the four spent bullets in the one live round. The fact that there was still one live round was disturbing to me. That told me they didn't go to the range and shoot, or they would have spent all five rounds. You know, whatever they did, they saved one round because they didn't need it. Also in the car was a parking permit for the Rainbow Condominium. They have Josh and Jeannie's IDs. They have all the things that you would see in Frenium. And we need to go search it now in case these people are still there and alive and need help. Detectives race to the Rainbow Condominiums, hoping to find Josh and Jeannie and rescue them if necessary. We didn't need a warrant to go to that unit. We went there under exigent circumstances, believing Jeannie and Josh might be there. We called for an ambulance and put them on standby in case we did find them. I, I really hoping we were going to find them. Detectives went from bottom to top, searching everywhere, looking for little human beings. But when I went downstairs, I looked to the left. Behind the couch is a couch table. And on that couch table is a rubber keychain that said Atlantis Condominium. Now, we were at the Rainbow Condominium. Josh and Jeannie were staying at the Atlantis condominium. And in the living room on the glass table, right next to what looked like cocaine, were two spent bullets. And both of them had flesh and blood on them. And that was very disturbing. I knew in my gut, some, and we were determined to find that out. With no sign of Josh and Jeannie, detectives will need a warrant to search any further. While police work on getting a warrant, Erica and BJ Sifford are booked on robbery charges. Their belongings are taken into evidence, and police notice that Erica has some pricey stuff, including a designer purse and jewelry. She had a $10,000 ring in her purse, and her other jewelry, I would say about another five to $7,000. She also had a necklace. On this necklace was, was apparent blood evidence. So the ring was sent to the lab to have analysis of DNA. Meanwhile, Detective Bernal does a background check on the Sifrits in preparation to interview them. BJ was a Navy SEAL. He was a medic. He was the youngest ever to graduate. But not only that, he graduated as honor man. It's a very prestigious award. And I was honor man in the Marine Corps. And I have never met another honor man until I met B.J. Sifford. And I thought there might be mutual respect there. And it backfired. Attorney. He didn't even give me his name. He said, well, you got my wife, you know my name. If you want to know anything more, talk to her. I went to interview Erica. Uh, she was very anxious, bubbly, flirtatious. Uh, really didn't seem to have a care in the world. She had no concept of why she was there and how serious this was. She pretty much answered everything until I got to the questions about Jeannie and Josh. Detective Bernal asks Erica how she got Josh and Jeannie's IDs, but she dodges the question. She denies. Tell me straight, are they dead or alive? Or give me some statistics on it. 70-30, uh, uh, 60-40. And she said 50-50. Armed with a warrant, detectives head back to the Rainbow Condominium, where Erica and BJ Sifret have been staying and where police suspect there might be forensic clues leading to Josh Ford and Janie Crutchley. I called in our forensics unit. They found that the bathroom was scrubbed clean. It was immaculate to the naked eye, according to our forensics unit on the floorboard. And it pretty much canvassed the entire bathroom floor. Underneath the vanity, in that bathroom, if you looked up, there was a smear of blood. On the back of one of the drawers, 
there was a droplet of blood that you could see where it, it, it had hit the top and then dripped down. There was blood stains along the baseboard. And there was blood evidence found within the hot tub. It was a very disturbing sight. Our forensics unit also found a bullet hole. The bullet went through the drywall and came out the other. Meant to allow whoever's in the hot tub to look out and see the ocean. And on those panes of glass were handprints, almost as if someone was banging on it, just hoping for help. While the forensics team is focusing on the bathroom, in the living room, Detective Bernal finds a key piece of evidence. I happen to look down, and there's a stack of pictures. The very top photograph was uh, like a contact sheet with every photo that's in it. And one of the first pictures was a picture of Josh and Jeannie. They find a disturbing record of memories. Erica had meticulously detailed scrapbooks of her life with BJ. She literally packed up the whole house to come down here for a few days. She had several tubs plastic tubs like you would put Christmas stuff in with items. And one of them was scrapbooks. Scrapbooks that were the timeline of their events from the time they met through the marriage all the way up to the photograph of Josh and Jeannie at Secrets the night they went missing. You could see a ring that he was wearing, which appeared to be a two-headed dragon. A ring just like that had been recovered from the purse of Erica Sifrit. Detective Bernal heads back to the station to question Erica. He uses the photo found at the Sifrit's condo as leverage to get her to talk. Erica finally admitted that they went to the bar to drink and she said Josh and Jeannie had offered to pay for our bus pass if we would pay for their first drink. So that's Josh and Jeannie, that they invited their vacation buddies back to the Rainbow Condominiums to party in the hot tub. Josh and Jeannie stopped at their house at the, at the Atlantis to get their bathing suits. And things went bad very quickly once they entered. Erica tells police that she couldn't find her purse and her expensive ring. She accused Josh and Jeannie of stealing it. And when BJ heard about this, he went ballistic and pulled out a gun. Erica said that BJ points the gun at him and says, get naked. Jeannie and Josh, uh, of course, has it. And BJ searches their clothing, and they don't have Erica's ring. Erica told us that Josh and Jeannie ran upstairs to escape him with the gun. They went into the bathroom, closed the door, and locked the door shut, at which point BJ followed behind. According to Erica, BJ shoots the door. Shot goes through the door and hits Josh, and then BJ kicks the door open. Josh, suffering from a bullet wound, slumps, but he's still alive. Erica said, Josh looks up at BJ and says, why are you doing this? He says, you. Jeannie was in there frantically trying to find a way out. She got down as far away as she could from them, which was under the vanity. Erica says, BJ fired a shot at Jeannie Crutchley, but missed. We found that missed bullet. It was on the other side of that wall. Them, according to Eric, Jeannie's under the van and he's screaming. Because of all her screaming, BJ just grabs the knife and cuts her throat. She probably bled out, which is where we got all the depth of that blood on the floor. I just can't imagine. There's no saving her. Um, I, I can't even imagine that, nor do I want to. Erica tells detectives that she had no part in any of this. She says that BJ put a gun to her head, threatened to kill her, and forced her to help him get rid of the bodies. 
Erica said that she was afraid of her husband, that she was so glad that they had come and caught them burglarizing this door because now she could be away from him. She maintained she was not a part of the homicide, but that she had evidence that would help us find. We dumped the bodies in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. So we jump in a car and go with her into Delaware. And the first dumpster we see, she says, that's it. We spend all morning looking through that thing, and there was nothing but drywall and rolled up carpets. She lied to us. Erica has detectives driving around for hours. She points to different dumpsters along the way, but all of them come up empty. At some point, you have to become a little more aggressive with a suspect who you have to pull teeth with to get information, and Eric was that. Dumped the bodies in a ditch. Like that, a switch went off. Completely different person. You I will cut your throat from ear to ear. BJ would never throw their bodies in a ditch. And she said, we cut them up and we put them in different dumpsters. I'm thrown back because I think we're looking for bodies, not body parts. BJ was a trained medic, and he would know the human body just as well as a physician. And in and, and the military canvas style duffel bag zipped on the side. Police contact the Sussex County Sanitation Department to figure out area garbage routes. They were really on top of things. They wanted to know what day the murder happened, if we knew what day it was disposed of, and where the body was disposed of. That helped them narrow down which cell in the landfill was probably where those bodies would be. It was hot, it was humid, and as you can see, it was dusty, dirty, then a dump. And it was like finding a needle in a haystack. We even had cadaver dogs, and they weren't functioning because they, there were too many different odors. But after an hour of searching, a sanitation worker spots something. At the end of the bucket of this excavator, you could plainly see there was a, a human leg. It's, it's an unusual feeling when you actually find human remains. Uh, it's a sadness, but you're also excited that you were able to find it. It was surreal. At that moment, I realized, you know, we're going to find them. There's find a human arm. What was so significant about this arm was that there was a tattoo on it. And that tattoo was the identical tattoo that his brother Mark had on his arm, and it was of their dojo up in Boston. They located Josh's torso with the head's arms and legs cut off, as Erica described, in a military-style duffel bag. And inside that bag, the body was wrapped in blankets that came from the Rainbow Condominium. The search for Josh and Jeannie officially ends in the world. My parents sat me down and told me that, you know, my dad was gone um, and he wasn't coming back. And uh, I remember leaving the house and going to a, uh, like a tire swing in the front yard and just swinging on it for probably an hour, just silent, not talking to anybody. Ocean City detectives are driven to bring justice for the families of Josh and Jeannie. Thanks to Erica's need to document her life in scrapbooks, detectives stumble upon a terrifying near miss. I'm a background in nightclubs, bars, and so forth. And the police went out of their way to identify every one of those people in every one of those pictures. And one of the people that they found was Melissa Seelig. When detectives track down Melissa, she shares a story about the Sifrits that is chillingly familiar. On Tuesday after the Memorial Day weekend, 
A friend of hers had met the Sifrits in a bar and called Melissa to come hang out with them. The Sifrits convinced Melissa and her friend to come back to the Rainbow condominiums. And when they get into the condo, Erica's purse goes missing. This week, I have no problem doing it again. Melissa pleads with BJ and convinces him to let her try to find the purse. And she does under some couch cushions. It turned that switch off in BJ, and he actually was talking to them like they were best friends. She never called the police, but it was the same MO that BJ and Erica used with Jeannie and Josh. Meanwhile, the medical examiner is able to find evidence that strengthens the prosecution's case against BJ and Eric. Jeannie Crutchley's legs. That's all that was ever recovered from Jeannie. The pathologist ruled that Jeannie couldn't have survived after that leg was removed because it wasn't done in a hospital where they could stop the bleeding, and so it was a homicide. In the torso of Joshua Ford, right under where his head was supposed to have been. There was a piece of lead. It turned out to be a bullet. It really is divine intervention. That bullet should not have been on that body throughout the ordeal of everything it's been through. The pathology cause of death was gunshot wounds. The Emmy's office sends the bullets recovered from Josh's body to the lab for analysis. And the forensic report on the bullets is very telling. Through DNA, uh, we can tell that the bullets that we recovered all came from the same weapon, which was the 357 revolver that Erica had on her person when she was arrested. Also, the DNA on that bullet on the table turned out to be Joshua's DNA. In addition to that, the ring that was recovered from Erica's purse was found to have Josh's blood and DNA. On June 1st, Fur charged with two counts of first-degree murder, along with a slew of other charges. At the request of the families of the victims, Joel Todd's office agrees to take the death penalty off the table. A month after the murders of Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley, Erica has struck a deal with prosecutors. Benjamin would talk to the police, but Erica wanted to cooperate. So we were going to use her as a witness. We had agreed that if Erica wasn't involved with the homicide, and she would testify against her. But in order for that to happen, she had to take and pass a polygraph, proving that she was not involved. A month after the murders of Joshua Ford and Jeannie Crutchley, Erica sits down for a polygraph pre-interview. During that pre-test interview, Erica made a lot of statements that were much more incriminating than she was the one that had killed Jeannie, that she had stabbed her with a knife she was surprised how much pressure it took to pierce the flesh. Now, that's something one would only know if they'd ever done something like that. She said that following that, while she was in Ocean City, she went and got a tattoo. And she had it put on her side at the same location where she had stabbed Jeannie Crutchley. She said she wasn't involved. Now we know she was involved. We're not well. In April 2003, Benjamin Sifrit goes on trial. Prosecutors call to the stand the woman who narrowly escaped the Sifrit's murderous weekend, Melissa Seeley. Melissa recounts her horrifying night with the Sifrits and testifies that BJ had told her he killed two people just days before. 
Lissa acknowledges that BJ said either I killed or we killed them. Then the man who has stayed silent this entire time, BJ Sifrit, takes the stand in his own defense. He was asleep in the car. He never got up the stairs. And he didn't wake up until Erica had come down and said, I killed two people. I need your help. We got to get rid of the bodies. And then he indicated that he went into the bathroom to see what happened to Josh and Jeannie, and then came back out. But I was able to argue to the jury that this was inconsistent with the crime scene. Now, we know that the blood was probably uh, half an inch deep into the bathroom, and he indicated that he went in, and then he comes out, but there's no blood stains on the carpet. But it's because Benjamin didn't talk to the police and Erica didn't testify against him. It made uh, the prosecution of him more difficult because all of the stuff, you know, the driver's licenses, the bullets, the gun, all of that stuff was on Erica. None of that was on Benjamin. He didn't have any of that evidence connecting him with the victims in the case. And on April 4th, 2003, the jury clears BJ of all charges in Josh Ford's death. But in Jeannie's case, it's harder to deny BJ's involvement since her death is not linked to Erica's gun. BJ's convicted of second degree to 38 years in prison with the possibility of parole. The Ford family was most unhappy. We did not believe that that was nearly enough time. I'm totally disgusted, totally took away a good brother. There's no it's, justice needed. No case. justice. I have yet to receive any justice. On June 3rd, 2003, Erica Sifrit goes on trial. The same witnesses who testified at BJ's trial also testify at hers. But it's the use of her 357 revolver that seals her fate. The jury murder and the death of Jeannie Two months later, she's sentenced to life plus 25 years with the possibility of parole. For detectives, Erica and Benjamin Sifrit's cruelty is unlike anything they've ever seen. We see pictures of Erica and BJ out eating crabs right after they murdered two people, as if they were just here on vacation and having a great time. I don't know why they killed Jeannie and Josh and why they think they had to do it, but I've never met an inhumane as these two. And I mean that, never. In the years after the murders, Zachary Ford struggles to grow up without his dad. I couldn't say his name. I couldn't talk about him for close to 10 years without just crying. But Zachary's pain drives him on a very focused path, a path that takes him all the way through law school. Before the tragedy happened, I was going to play football, some kind of sports. But as soon as this tragedy happened, from age eight, I just had a very narrow mindset, narrow goal. I was going to be a criminal prosecutor. I want it was brought by Joel Todd here. It is the 20-year anniversary of my father, Josh, and Jeannie's murder. And coincidentally, it is the first year where Benjamin is available to apply for parole. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the situation is rectified at the parole hearing. While he waits to argue his case against B.J. Sifrit's release, Zachary remembers his father. I still do have the ring that he was wearing when he was murdered. That is something that I'll take out every once in a while and just kind of hold and kind of reflect. The funny, social, um, always willing to help someone out, someone that needs bus fare, for example. Just knowing what I lost based on all the good times we had, all the laughter, all the fun, knowing that I'll never be able to do that with him again, knowing that he wasn't there at my wedding, won't be there for my kids. Yeah, it's, it's tough. 